minute early and we're having a little bit of a mental breakdown. <laughs> it's fine. Literally everything's fine. No, it, not really. Actually, it is. Um, so like everything in a literal sense is fine. But in another sense, I feel like getting to spring break is as if I am crawling through glass, like little shards of glass, which is fine. It's not anyone's fault. It's the government's fault. Um, but we're here and we're trying. Some of us are. Not all of us are. And my hair is greasy and I think I'm about to get my period and it's just like really not the vibes. And sorry if that was TMI, but I really just wanted to set the tone for the night. Like I feel like the energy in this stream tonight is like, have you ever had a teacher who like shared too much about their personal life and like they came in and they were like, oh my God, I'm sorry. Like I'm having this custody battle right now. And like just randomly, like not a teacher who always overshares. That's not the energy I'm going for. I'm going for a teacher who's like normally normal. And then one day you're just like, oh my God, what is happening to you? That's me right now. That's what we're doing. <laughs> so we're here to talk about the Civil War. Um, This is not going to be a military vibe. I just need to warn you about that. Oh, and speaking of warnings, let's read the disclaimer. So the information presented in this session is for edutainment, that's educational entertainment purposes only. It does not reflect the viewpoints or endorsements of any government entity, nor is, I wish, I wish a government entity felt this way, nor is it aligned to any state or district cur curriculum. Also, I wish, if I ever become dictator of this country, that's the first thing I'm doing. I've always said I have no interest in being the president, but being a dictator, I could really, I think I would have a great time doing that you know what I mean I would only want to do it for a little while anyway I can't even get through a disclaimer I told you tonight was going to be a fucking disaster please note the oh views expressed in this session reflect the personal opinions of the presenter that's me it's my opinion and if you don't like it that's literally fine no one's making you be here please note that this content presented here differs from the presenter's classroom instruction chat GPT help me write this um someone clip that disclaimer please Thanks. I, I love when you guys have clips. If you ever like DM me a clip, that makes me so fucking happy. Um, I want to be a dictator and fix everything and leave before everyone else fucks it up. Exactly. Exactly. But anyway, let's go ahead and get into it. For those of you on the tickety talk, you have to come to Twitch to see the pictures. Um, also, I got rained on today. Like it's literally just like the horrors persist. They're persisting really hard recently. But anyway, welcome to the Civil War. Last week, we left off with the South seceding and the first shots being fired at Fort Sumter, South Carolina. So if you want to go watch that video, you're more than welcome to, but you don't have to and you'll still understand what's going on here. Why are people fighting basically over slavery, but no one was even doing anything about slavery? So actually, let me give like a, a quick Spark Notes version of last week for anyone that wasn't here last week. So basically, the South had slavery because they had a geography that was conducive to a plantation system. It's not because they, the North was any inherently more moral or anything like that. It was literally just came down to economics of why slavery expanded in the South and not in the North. Um, or more geography than economics. But anyway, so in the North, there started to be some like anti-slavery sentiment, but not really a ton. The main issue came when we were growing West, we had to decide, are we going to allow slavery in the states out West? or Are we going to prohibit slavery? No one was really trying to end slavery in the South. Like Lincoln was not trying to end slavery in the South, which you will see that play out a lot this week. Lincoln was really not trying to end slavery in the South. And really no one in Congress was trying to end slavery in the South. They should have been. A few random people were. But there was no real effort to do that. But a fair number of, oh, we'll talk about Missouri, um, a fair number of congressmen, and, or what the fuck am I saying? Anyway, a fair number of Southerners were freaking the fuck out because a fair number of the congressmen didn't want slavery to go out west. So the congressmen really had no beef with the South. Like they really were not trying to prohibit slavery in the entire country. They were just not trying to extend slavery out west. And it wasn't even because they thought that slavery was wrong because a lot of them were really shitty people. It was because they were worried about the labor market out west. And they were like, oh, if we allow slavery out west, then the super wealthy Southerners, which last week we went really in depth about like the, the economics of slavery and like 
like the how it was like such an aristocrat system of like of the top one percent they were worried that basically the top one percent of southerners would monopolize all the land out west and there would no longer be opportunities out west for white working class northerners that was their main reasoning for not allowing slavery in what what you see on this map is that like yellow orange territory so basically Lincoln got elected to be the president. Lincoln didn't even get the majority of the vote, but there were four people running for president, which was fucked up. And again, there's more detail about that in the previous stream. So he won the like most of he won the highest amount of electoral votes, even though he didn't get the majority because so many fucking people were running. And when Lincoln won the presidency, that's when the South seceded because Lincoln was a free soiler and free soilers didn't want slavery out West. Lincoln never said he was going to end slavery in the South. So like it was low key dramatic of them to secede and start a civil war. And also I think we have this really false narrative that Lincoln was like an amazing person and that like the North did this because like they just thought it was so wrong when like, the North was extremely complicit in slavery. Most of the slavery in the South, enslaved people were picking cotton, and that cotton was shipped up North, and those businesses made textiles out of them. So, like, it's not like the North was like, this is so wrong. Um, eventually, that was more the case when people learned more about slavery because of the Fugitive Slave Act and because of the book Uncle Tom's Cabin that was super popular. Um, abolitionist was, like more of a thing but it was never like that was never the motivation of the war and I go into much detail about that from last week's stream but just to start us off here tonight my ring is stuck in my hair I fucking love my life no one was worried about slavery only money exactly pretty much the only people worried about slavery were like the people that were currently enslaved and then like the small abolitionist movement that was present and like eh, not small because after a while the abolitionist movement did get really big Fun fact, we're reading, also we have a cherry Dr. Pepper tonight. Fun fact, we're reading the Civil War Magic Treehouse book to my pre-K students currently. Should I get my students Magic Treehouse books? I think I should. I think I should. So anyway, let's get into the Civil War where we left off. The first shots had just been fired at Fort Sumter. The South shot first. They seceded and they shot. So they started it. Um, so I am mainly going to focus on social and economic effects. I am barely going to cover military history because I think it's boring as fuck. We're going to talk about a few major battles in context of the war at large. But if you were looking for a two hour deep dive about like muskets and like battle strategies and like battle positioning, this is not that there's a lot of people out there talking about that. I'm not one of them. Um, but if you would like to talk about how the majority of the population was affected and the economics and the social impacts, that's what we will be talking about. So first, and like I said, I'm like a little off my rocker tonight. So this is going to be a little more casual. And if it's not perfect, I'm sorry about that. But I think you'll still get a lot out of it. Um, so the border states, someone who said, I feel like Missouri was barely in the union. You're motherfucking right. This is more evidence that the union did not have morality around this war. There were states that allowed slavery that did not secede. So Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, and Missouri, and then West Virginia. This is how West Virginia became a state because the Western part of Virginia was like, fuck you, Virginia. We don't want to secede. So we're going to be West Virginia. And they like off and made West Virginia. So these states did not secede. These are states that were actively practicing slavery, but they just decided it wasn't worth fighting a war over, I guess. A lot of them had more diversified economies as well um, and just like other things going on. DND until tomorrow at 7 a.m. Fuck yeah. Um, so yeah, there were multiple states that allowed slavery in the Union and they didn't secede because but they ended up dying anyway, because that's where a lot of the war was like fighting. Womp womp. So why did they not secede? Kentucky. President Abraham Lincoln considered Kentucky's loyal to the Union as an important factor. They were a neutral state at first, but then became under control of the Union later. Maryland was also important because Maryland was the only thing between Virginia and the Union capital of Washington, D.C. So it's like an important buffer. And Maryland had voted and Maryland also voted to abolish slavery during the war. So like I said, Maryland had other economic things going on. So it wasn't like as big of a shtick to them. 
Um, Missouri. At the start of the war, Missouri decided to remain in the Union and not secede, but many people felt that the war against the Confederacy was wrong, and so the Missouri state government actually split into two rival state governments. This country is such a fucking joke. Having two rival state governments is like really giving Disney teen movie where it's like, oh my god, the other team is trying to run the state. Like, what are you? Be serious. Rival state governments? Work it out. Get in there and work it out. What the fuck is going on? Um, one of the state governments, like, do you think anyone was double crossing and they were in both state governments? Because that's what I would have done. I would have been like, yo, the other state government's crazy. They're talking shit about us. <laughs> They're talking shit about you mainly because I'm doing the same thing with them. Um, but anyway. One of the state governments wanted to secede. The other one would stay. So as a result, the state was claimed by both the Union and the Confederacy at different amounts of time. Although Delaware allowed slavery, there were very few amounts of people that owned slaves in Delaware. So they were always loyal to the Union. And like I said, West Virginia, they formed um, their own state. But around 20,000 West Virginia men fought on the side of the Confederacy. So like it's very much giving divorce. Like, it's very much giving child of divorce. And other states that are sometimes considered border states are Tennessee, Oklahoma, and Kansas. These, all these states had strong support for the Confederacy and the Union. So a lot of these, like, middle states, there was some discrepancy. I think that's what a lot of people, like, have as a misconception where they're like, oh, everyone here felt this way and everyone here felt this way like this is a fucking civil war like there's people in both areas with differing political opinions like a lot of people live in areas like if you live in I don't know like Texas and you live in rural Texas that doesn't automatically mean that you're a Republican like there's a lot of people that have a differing political belief to the area that they live in so in a civil war those people are like kind of fucked because like you're in the spot and you're just lumped in with all of those people, which is really jarring to think about. And for those of you on TikTok, you have to come to Twitch to see all the pictures and stuff. Um, so anyway, why are they important? They gave the union an important advantage in troops, factories, and money. Um, and we kind of already talked about this. And it is true that brothers fought brothers in the Civil War. Families across the country were split over the issue, and even sons fought against their fathers. Because when you look at the battle maps later... You will see. So this is a quote from Lincoln that I always share because I think it's so this is exactly how he felt. Like if you give him one thing, at least he's honest, like honest Abe. I see the why he got that fucking nickname. Um, again, this is not how I feel. This is a Lincoln quote. If I could save the union without freeing a, any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. He really just wanted to keep the country together. That's all he gave a fuck about. That's it. That is it. Like, you could not take less of a stand in a sentence. <laughs> and I think it's also very um, telling about how this war was really, like, about money you know like I don't want to say it wasn't over slavery from the perspective of like people are like it was states rights you know I don't feel that way but it's just so interesting that like this goes to show for the southerners it was about slavery but for the northerners it was not about slavery it was about keeping the country together like especially for like people like Lincoln and the government Lincoln the pick me Lincoln said what do y'all want what do y'all want well, he at the time didn't think the war was about slavery. Exactly. We'll talk about when he like started talking about slavery because for a long time he really wouldn't say anything. So we're going to go through the military stuff and that'll be much shorter. And then we'll get into more like the social political stuff. So advantages of the union, more industry, larger population, way better transportation. 72% of the nation's railroads were in the union. Railroads are kind of important during a war because keep in mind, we don't really have cars. We do not have cars at this time. Cars is not a thing. 
advantages of the confederacy which is the south they had very well-trained generals their generals we'll talk about this in a second had gone to like west point like all these fancy ass fucking places they also had very high troop morale because in the south like i said for the south it was over slavery so the south was like we're we're defending our way of life son we gotta fight here so like they really gave a fuck is what i'm trying to say when the northern soldiers were like i have been working at a factory since i was seven i don't even fucking know what's going on right now like you got to see one of those people has a little more skin in the game. The South also had the home field advantage. They most of the battles took place in the South. This is a pro during the war because you know where shit is. This is a con after the war because then all your shit is fucked up. So I wouldn't know if I would put that under advantages or not. So some of the numbers on that, the northern states had 21.5 million people. The southern states had 9 million. The northern states had over 100,000 factories. Southern states only had 20,000. Because, again, it's not like the north is going to be willing to sell, like, ammunition and stuff to the south. So the south's going to have to produce that shit on their own. The north had way more money. Um, and the north had way more cotton production, which is a really fucking – or not way more. I lied. The North had way less cotton production, which is really unimportant during a war. Like the amount of cotton you have, you can uniforms only go so far. You only need so many of them because when people die, you can just reuse them. So here's another graph just to show you the South. Really, all they had going for them was cotton. Womp womp. Losers. Um, so more graphs. Yay. Here's a railroad map. So as you can see, the South is not very connected. So keep in mind, if you need to move troops and like move supplies and shit from, I don't know, New Orleans to Charleston, you don't even have a direct route to do that. Like the railroads to nowhere are what's getting me. They had cotton and delusion. And again, they started the war. Like I really do think if imagine how the, the country would look today. Imagine if the South never seceded because then I feel like we would low-key still have slavery in the South, not slavery in like the 1800 sense, but like a, like a modern prison-y system that's even worse than the one we already have since. You know what I'm saying? Because think about the North literally had almost no real effort to end slavery in the South. They really didn't. They just didn't want it to continue out West. But again, that's so much from last week's stream. So here's the size of the forces. The war lasted from 61 to 65. So at every single point in time, the Union had more people. Put cotton and delusion on a T-shirt, but make it be out of polyester. Um, and then there's a little graphic and yada, 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 yada. So the Southern military tradition, most of the fighting took place in the South and Confederates felt very, very confident. For one thing, they only had to wage a defensive war. They were just trying to like defend most of the South rather than trying to invade a different place. And they knew that they just had to wait for the morale to erode up North because they were like, these motherfuckers don't care about this. Um, do, do, do. And the Union had to try and conquer and control the Confederate 750,000 square miles of territory. The South is big, y'all. Um, and many Southerners, like I said, have attended West Point. They had served as army officers. And most Southern young men had experience using guns and had experience with horses. But most of the young men up north, they had been like in a coal mine since they were like five. So they didn't really know like how to fight in a battle. But like if you've hunted before, you're like, like shooting a person is it also I just saw the person that said people please are Abe that's really fucking funny um shooting a person's like not that different than hunting I would imagine I've never done either but it seems pretty comparable to me um so the southerners are just like better equipped at that so even though they lost the war spoiler alert um they had the better generals so they had better like military knowledge better at forming battle tactics better decision making all of their generals had a lot more experience so they were actually winning for the first two years of the war um and this is from reddit so so this person that was just in like a civil war discussion for him i think confederate soldiers were more used to outdoor lives in the book cold mountain which i've never heard of the confederates referred to union soldiers as mill boys because they often worked in factories and had poor survival skills in the woods or battlefield they also had a superior cavalry in the beginning so really their military just knew what the fuck they were doing so even though they didn't have as many people and as much money they were really confident because their military was so much better and because the, the northerners were just like so bad at being at war so 
Following the attack on Fort Sumter in April 1861, the two sides were officially at war. It was three months later, the first battle at Bull Run, also known as the Battle of Manassas, that the true nature of this war became known. Because Fort Sumter is technically a battle, but there weren't a ton of people there. It was just the like people inside the fort defending it and then like the little people outside. Like It wasn't full militaries. It was just the first shots fired. So this is really the full... like battle battle the union thought it was gonna be easy as fuck the union was like we have more money we have a bigger military and like more money and a bigger military help you in the long run but on day one like it's who has more skill you know what i'm saying like once you start to run out of people and money that'll help be helpful but at the beginning the southerners were like really really kicking their asses um so the union thought it was gonna be an easy win but they were driven did slaves fight in the war we will discuss yes they did um, they were driven back by General Stonewall Jackson and they were forced to retreat into Washington 25 miles north. So womp womp. Um, let me switch the mic really quick. This is kind of corny, but I actually don't even remember why I put it in here. I'll be honest with you. Couldn't tell you. Um, but anyway. Oh, I know. So it's like a shot from a movie and then someone has like text over it where they explain like the history stuff. So this is obviously not real footage. Obviously not real footage. Just to clarify, we had photos, no videos. But this is the Battle of Bull Run or Manassas. So this is the Union. You see how the Union has like cunty uniforms? Like they all match, their guns match, they have fancy little hats. That's the Union. They have the American flag. That's the Confederates. They have the Confederate. Oh no. No, it's not. I'm a dumbass. That's the Union. So that, because I think that that's a little bit boring. Um, I told you this was not going to be a military vibe, but. So nearly a thousand deaths in total on both sides. This battle showed that the war was going to be very long and very bloody. So side note, rich people used to watch for fun. I guess they didn't have TV back then. So that's valid. Um, Spending, sending thousands to die for your opinion is crazy. No, it really is. Like, if you want to die, that's your fucking business. But you're not going to send other people when you're not even going. It's one thing to be like, I'm going and I want you to come with me. But you don't go. So what? what's it to you? Anyway, so on July 21st, 1861, lots of people from Washington went to the countryside of Manassas, Virginia to watch the first major battle of the Civil War. This country is so unserious. Like, we're at a Civil War and you're watching? You're watching? That's weird. The onlookers were shook when they realized an actual battle was happening. Like, what did you think? Rich people would go watch this because nobody thought this was serious. <laughs> With sandwiches and opera glasses. It's a young adult dystopian novel. So, um, do, 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 do. where was I? This is known as the picnic battle because spectators showed up with sandwiches and opera glasses. The onlookers, who included a number of U.S. congressmen, expected a quick victory for the Union and a swift end to the war that begun three months before. So it's three months after the first shots were fired. So they were like... Let's go watch these little losers. And then they watched a thousand people die in front of them. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. It's not funny. <laughs> um, on July 16th, federal forces led by Brigadier General Ir Irving McDowell began marching to the nation's capital towards the strategic railroad junction at Manassas. 30 miles away, Confederate forces were commanded by that guy. Five days later, ordinary citizens and reporters um, went to the went uh, went to check it to air the area out and many people found themselves a few miles from the actual fighting the battle got off to a promising start for the yankees like we said but the confederates called in reinforcements and counterattacked. union troops who likely saw their opponents were um poorly trained began who like their opponent who like their opponents were poorly trained 
I disagree with that. I don't think they were poorly trained. The Southerners knew what they were doing. But the Union began to withdraw. Some soldiers panicked and ran from the battlefield, and spectators like made this even fucking more chaotic because everyone's just freaking out. And civilians hustled back to Washington along with the retreating Union troops, and some legislators attempted to like kind of calm people down. A senator from Michigan, though, tried to block the main road to Washington, while one from Ohio grabbed a gun and threatened to shoot any deserters so most people like were like let me get the fuck out of here this is a real battle but a few of them like got really usually the battles were like one to a couple days it depends it really just depends amusing summer outing but imagine like you think it's gonna be a fun cool time and then like a lot of people are dying so you're like okay maybe let's get out of here and then someone's like you're gonna fucking leave you're gonna fucking leave like Relax. Relax. Um, Henry Wilson, a senator from Massachusetts and future vice president, took pity on the fleeing soldiers and he gave them sandwiches as they passed by. That's so me. <laughs> Sorry, you're lost. Sorry, your friends died. Here's a tuna sandwich. Did they have canned tuna back then? I feel like probably not. Um, What an empath. <laughs> <laughs> you might be an empath if you feel like you should offer someone food when their friend was just brutally slaughtered in front of them how did they know when and where to show up like did they send invites so like they were saying the forces had like the union and the confederate forces had gathered around this area so people were like hey guys there's gonna be a battle do you guys want to go and see the battle and watch a battle out of war yeah they didn't have canned tuna damn war and no tuna me anxiously watching everyone die just to be handed a tuna sandwich. Sorry, it's multigrain. <laughs> this is so funny. Um, out of the 28,000 Union soldiers that at the first Battle of Bull Run, 2,800 were either killed, wounded, missing, or captured. And of the more than 32,000 Confederates, there were over 1,900 casualties. This battle showed Congress. And when they said showed Congress, they meant Congress saw. They were there. They got blood splatter on their forehead. Um, that showed Congress and President Abe Lincoln that this war was going to be longer and tougher than they had anticipated. They didn't even have sliced bread, no chips or nothing. <laughs> uh, so they were like, we need a plan. We need a plan, you guys. It's tough because, like, I really want to joke because... I think that war is just so like dumb and unserious of us to do. And it's so fucking sad that people die. So I like to make fun of the leaders a lot. But I also know that this is really like slavery adjacent because it's literally the fucking civil war. So I don't think that I'm joking about the topic of slavery. I would never do that. I'm more joking at how fucking incompetent the government was and currently is. So the Union Army created a plan. I think that they look so sassy in this picture. I like. The, if I was them, I would have been like, let's do a silly one. <laughs> like, And then I also think a lot of them stick their hands in their shirts. And someone told me that they did that if they were missing a finger. But also, like, I think that that's more obvious than if you just put your hands behind your back. I love that they're all looking at different directions. <laughs> Who knew we couldn't just line up some miners and factory workers and call it a strategy? I have no idea how battles happen. I feel like meeting up would require too much coordination between the leaders for them to decide to go through with that. They were just kind of in the same area and like peeped each other is what I think happened. And I looked this up, but I could not find it anywhere online. But my history teacher in high school told me, and I'm choosing to believe it because it makes me laugh, that during the like war, sometimes after a battle, the generals of each side would meet up with each other and be like, your men fought very bravely and like have a like a fucking brunch debrief. I couldn't find evidence of that anywhere, but... That just feels pretty on brand for them. So what's their plan? What's the plan, people? Stage one is the Anaconda plan. They realized, all right, we don't know how to fight. And all of these guys have been working in a factory since they were three years old. So they don't know how to fight either. Um, 
Morning after battle debrief with the girls, not the soldier circle jerk. Were there tuna sandwiches at the debrief, do you think? How romantic. So anyway, they realized that they were not going to win this with skill. uh, So they decided to try and cut off the South from all of their supplies because the South traded cotton with other countries. That's why they were so rich. So they were like, if we block off all of your ports, you won't be able to trade anymore. And remember, the South doesn't have that many factories. So this is called Scott's Great Snake um, because Winifield Scott was the general at the opening of the Civil War, thought that this would make them surrender very quickly. He was right in the fact that it did really cripple them, but he was wrong in the fact that that would make them surrender. They really like fought, fought, fought. So Antietam, April 17th, 1862. And the war is moving kind of slow. There were some other battles around this time, but this is one of the other major ones. So the South had won a lot of small battles throughout 1861. The South was really winning for the first two years. So Antietam is not the bloodiest battle because some battles lasted multiple days, but Antietam is the bloodiest day in American history. Does that make sense? Because it was a 12-hour battle. Some of the other battles lasted much longer. And the Union won. So things are looking up, ladies. 23,000 soldiers were killed, wounded, or missing, which is insane. Um, This is the deadliest one-day battle in American history. And this showed that the Union could stand against the Confederate Army um, in the Eastern Theater. I hate that they call war a theater. I feel like it's I feel like the way we talk about war makes it sound like it's not real and it is real. Like people are dying. Those are people that didn't sign up for this. They didn't cause this and they didn't do this. So why are they dying? And why do we talk about it like it's a play? The theater, like, I don't like that. It doesn't sit right with me. Um, This also gave President Abraham Lincoln confidence to issue the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation rather to be able to do this in like a moment of strength more on this later when we get to like the social stuff so this is a clip from the movie glory of the battle of antietam this is a pretty like graphic clip will warn you about that but this is what it was like to fight in the civil war i don't know why i really showed you that other video this one's like more descriptive i think so this is again from a modern movie but the movie Okay, so you get the point. Okay, this was the statistic that I was looking for. So, one, let's go through the statistic. It's estimated that one in three Southern households lost at least one family member during the Civil War. And apparently one in 13 soldiers returned. So, like, a fuck ton of people died during the Civil War. Also, here's the hot air balloons. They used them for, like, recon. So yeah, the Civil War is like really, really, really fucking bad. I don't know if you guys didn't know that, but I knew that and it's really bad. Anyway, moving on to more bad stuff about the war. Kerchow. So there were more than 22,000 casualties at the Battle of Antietam. Doctors at the scene were overwhelmed, badly needing supplies. Um, Nurse Clara Barton was known as the angel of the battlefield. You've probably heard of her. She's famous. And during the night, both armies tended to their wounded and consolidate their lines. In spite of his diminished ranks, Lee continues to skirmish with McClellan on September 18th while removing his wounded from the Potomac River. So while they're trying to like remove the wounded people they're literally still fighting so that's why the death toll is so high i think late in the evening on september 19th realizing that no further attacks were coming lee withdraws from the battlefield and slips across the potomac back into virginia and then mcclellan sends see the military stuff is just so boring to mar- to me yeah i switched my mic back to the one that's close to me i know that there's mixed reviews on that one but i personally think it sounds better sorry if you hate it anyway where was i Um, Lincoln, even though it's considered like a tactical draw, Lincoln claims this to be a strategic victory. He was waiting for a successful military operation so that he could issue the preliminary emancipation proclamation. And on September 22nd, he vows that all the states that are in rebellion, the slaves there will be free on January 1st, 1863. This really, really changed the war because now it is explicitly an attack on slavery. When And before this, like we said, Lincoln had never really said he wanted to end slavery in the South now that he really, really, really was being clear about that. So 
Moving on to controlling the Mississippi. This is the other part of their plan. Because remember, we're going through a four-phase plan. So the Anaconda plan, they're choking off the supplies. Controlling the Mississippi is really important because not only can they not trade from the ocean now, now they're not even going to be able to trade with like just moving supplies up and down the river. General Ulysses S. Grant achieved that by 1863. That's also what caused Lincoln to focus more on slavery. We'll get into this a little more when we get into the social stuff, but it was really like he needed morale because the war has been going on so long so they like needed a thing to care about um so ulysses s grant controls the mississippi and splits the south in half so for his success at the battle of vicksburg he also placed because he was successful at vicksburg and took control of the river lincoln placed ulysses s grant in control this is when ulysses s grant like essentially got promoted so there's a widespread disagreement about when the turning point was because we all know now we know that the South was winning for the first two years. We're not really sure exactly when that flipped. Some people say it's the Battle of Vicksburg and some people say it's the Battle of Gettysburg, but it was generally sometime in like mid-1863 is when the Union started winning. So Union victory in Vicksburg gave the North control of the Mississippi and now the Confederacy is split in two and the war is starting to turn. And Union victory over Confederates at the Battle of Gettysburg gave the North their first major victory. Because at this point, even though the South is like starting to suffer, they're still really good fighters. So the North was still not doing awesome in battle. The South is just losing resources and starting to lose control because they don't have enough people. So... Lee didn't general or Robert E. Lee in the South Confederate general did not attempt any more offenses. So that means he's not trying to move north after this point. He's just trying to defend the South that he has. There were major costs, though. Over 51,000 men died in three days at the Battle of Gettysburg. This is the deadliest battle. So like I said, Antietam is the deadliest day. Gettysburg is the deadliest battle. 51,000 people. Oh, yes. And for those of you on TikTok, you have to come to Twitch to see the pictures. Love you so much. 51,000 people. So here are some photos. And I need to pick up the pace. We're only on slide 35. Here are some photos and paintings of battle scenes, what have you. Some of these you already looked at. Very sad. Very, very depressing and disgusting. So we're moving into phase three. Engage in total war. Total war means attacking soldiers and civilians because a lot of rich Southerners were giving money and food and weapons to the military. So General William T. Sherman, motherfucker's crazy, was like, if I go through the South and just start killing people and going into people's houses and like taking all their shit, they're going to give up. Because at this point, the South is running out of people. They have, like, no money. They're having a lot of issues. And now he's like, let's attack the civilians. Fuck it. Fuck it. So let's talk about Sherman's march to sea. This is unprecedented, the fact that they were going to start killing civilians. And just look at him. He looks so cranky and crazy. Look at him. I'm scared. Um, so this is the route that he took. He really went from Atlanta to Savannah. So that's a lot of the major cities in Georgia that, and you can see it was like multiple units of army going through fucking shit up. So Sir Sherman's March to Sea lasted for a little over a month. Um, and William Tecumseh Sherman went on this 285 mile long march. It lasted 37 days and it is remembered as one of the most successful examples of total war and the psychological effects persisted for decades in the South. So context and strategy, Ulysses S. Grant conferred with his generals and realized that they needed to bring the Confederate war machine to its knees. So Sherman was charged with three armies of about 100,000 men and his primary objective was to capture and neutralize the city of Atlanta, which was a major railroad hub and supply depot for Georgia and the Confederacy as a whole. Reconstruction would have went better. Yeah, but Sherman tried to do the right thing. He was confiscating land from slave owners and giving it to people that had been enslaved. So, like he did eat with that one, but maybe leave the railroads alone. So anyway, 
They were there for most of the summer, and Sherman finally forced a surrender of Atlanta on September 2nd. Sherman remained in Atlanta for a little over a month. He ordered the evacuation of 3,000 civilians, so literally the people in Atlanta who was just like, fuck off, get out, and seized their homes so that his soldiers could live in their homes. The Confederate forces were not stationary, though. They started moving the militaries out, um, and then they were... I'm going to skip over some of this, like military stuff of going into other cities taking over more areas taking more supplies yada 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 yada, yada. we're skipping so drew, 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 drew. where was i so sherman sent this telegram to ulysses s grant ulysses s grant is in charge of the military this is what sherman said to him on october 9th i propose we break up the railroad from chattanooga and strike out the wagons from milledgeville Mellon, and savannah until we can repopulate georgia it is useless to occupy it but the utter destruction of its roads houses and people will cripple their military resources by attempting to hold the roads we will lose a thousand men a month and will gain no results i can make the march and make georgia Georgia Howell. We have over 8,000 cattle and 3 million pounds of bread, but no corn. We can forage in the interior of the state. Although he had his reservations about this plan, Grant did give approval for it on November 7th. And on November 6th, a telegram to Grant, um, he said, Proof positive that the North can prevail in this contest, leaving only open the question of its willingness to use that power. So far more than a mere display of brute, for of brute force, Sherman's war was equal parts political and psychological. So on November 10th, the Union troops began torching buildings of any value in Atlanta. So they had been in Atlanta for a while that feeling when you secede and write your own constitution so the Union doesn't observe the Third Amendment in your land, literally. They were like, oh, you want to be your own country? Okay. Quartered. We live here now. Um, this is what America does best, baby. <laughs> Form your own country. We won't respect your rights. <laughs> you only get that here, and you don't even really get it here. But anyway, so they had been in Atlanta for a while, and then they really just started, like, burning shit. Burning shit up. Burning shit up. Oh, is it fourth? Yeah, it's fourth. You're right. I didn't realize Sherman was a union guy. I'm dumb. Yes, Sherman is very much a part of the union. So they basically burn Atlanta down and then they're like, hit the road. Let's keep it pushing. So the march, they were clearly headed eastward. Sherman was determined to conceal his movements from any Confederate eyes. So they kind of like split up their troops. I'm going to skip through some of this stuff. Most union soldiers complied with Sherman's orders. Um, Oh, wait, I actually didn't want to skip this. So Sherman gave explicit instructions regarding their conduct in special field order number 120. He encouraged foraging and taking livestock, but he forbid his soldiers from home invasions. But he said that they could destroy private and industrial property if they were antagonized by Confederate soldiers. So he basically said, like, steal their food, steal their livestock, don't break. No, it's third. It's third. I'm so bad at amendments and numbers. Um... Taking berries, good. <laughs> Taking babies, bad. <laughs> so he basically said, steal their food, steal their livestock. If they come at you, then you can take their property, but don't just take it. And most people complied with this. He also said that they could take black laborers. So he was like, if you pull up on a plantation and there's enslaved people there, tell them they can come with us. But he said to remain cognizant of your supplies. So basically, like, don't take people if you can't feed them, which is I don't know. That feels like pretty straightforward to me, but a lot of soldiers didn't comply with that. Most of them did, but some of them called bummers would intentionally loot um, and terrorize civilians. Although bummers engaged in prohibited activity, the overall psychological impact on the local population was precisely the purpose of the march. This effect was likely compounded by the army's continued railroad destruction. So they were pulling up the railroads as they went. Confederate leadership was unable to discern the final destination of the two pronged force because they split up. They like, didn't know if they were going to the same spot or not. Um, I'm going to skip through some of this. They took over the state capital of Milledgeville. Um, Georgia has changed its capital a million times. So that's another story for another day. Then they were going to Macon. They really just like went through everywhere and really, really fucked shit up. I'm going to skip over some of this. I don't know why I thought I wanted to go through like a million things. Um, 
do, 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 do. Where was I? So, do, do, do. I'm a mess today. I really am. I told you. I'm actually just going to skip over this whole thing. So, he takes over the basically entire strip of Georgia. And by around Christmas time, he gets to Savannah and takes over Savannah and wrote this telegram to Lincoln on December 21st when the Savannah mayor formally surrendered the city. The Savannah mayor, bummer, has racist ties. Yeah, it did. Feels so unorganized. I know. It's also because I'm presenting it unorganized because my brain is broken. But he wrote this telegram to President Lincoln. I beg to present to you as a Christmas gift the city of Savannah with 150 heavy guns and plenty of ammunition and about 25,000 bales of cotton. Sherman came in and fucked shit up. So his armies had about 1,300 casualties. The Confederates suffered about 2,300 casualties. And between 17,000 and 25,000 enslaved black people were freed on the march, including around 7,500 in Savannah, because this is after the Emancipation Proclamation, which we'll talk more about in a second. So the economic impact is staggering. In today's money, they destroyed over $1.5 billion worth of resources. Um, and still, like, they, it took decades and decades and decades for the South to recover from this. So apart from its economic and military payoff this lingered in the southern psyche this is part of why you hear like the south will rise again um when your secret santa goes way harder than you did so this is part of that like the south will rise again mentality is because of what sherman did so I've been talking about how terrible it was. Let me actually read it to you. So this is a diary entry from when this happened. Dolly Sumner Lunt was born in Maine in 1817. She moved to Georgia as a young woman. She was a school teacher in Covington where she met Thomas Burge, a plantation owner, and then they lived like yonder I think so they lived in the middle of nowhere so when her husband died in 1858 Dolly was left alone to manage her plantation and its slaves she kept a diary of her experiences it's long as fuck so I'm just gonna read part of it her diary is literally like 100 pages you can read the whole thing if you want it but this is when Sherman came through you can see dated November 19 1864 slept in my clothes last night as I heard that the Yankees went to neighbor Montgomery's on Thursday night at one o'clock searched his house drank his wine and took his money and valuables as we were not disturbed i walked after breakfast with sadai her nine-year-old daughter up to mr joe perry's my nearest neighbor where the yankees were yesterday saw miss laura perry in the road surrounded by her children seemed to be looking for someone she said that she was looking for her husband that old miss perry had just sent her word that the yankees went to james perry's i hate when everyone in a town is related the night before and plundered his house drove off all of his stock and that she must drive hers onto the old fields so people were like moving their cows so they wouldn't get stolen before we were done talking up came joe and jim perry from their hiding place jim was very much excited excited back then didn't mean positive it was like either um J happening to turn and look behind as we stood there i saw blue coats coming down the hill jim immediately raised his gun swearing he would kill them anyhow no don't i said ran home as fast as i could with sadai i could hear them cry halt halt as their guns went off in quick succession oh my god the time of trial has come a man passed on his way to covington i hallowed to him asking him if he did not know the yankee Yankees were coming no are they he don't keep up with the news yes they're not 300 yards from here sure enough he said this is so southern well I'll not go I don't want them to get my horse okay I hastened back to my frightened servants and told them that they better hide by servants she means slaves she went to tell her slaves to hide that's what she's talking about um then went back to the gate to claim protection and guard. So this bitch walks up to her gate thinking she's going to stop the Union Army. Paul Revere, but make him racist. <laughs> I love when old text use the words plunder unironically. Excuse me, ma'am. I live under an actual rock. <laughs> so she goes to her gate to try and fucking stop them. But like demons, they rush in. My yards were full. They went to her smokehouse, her dairy, her pantry, everywhere. Thousands of pounds of meat. She sounds rich. 
vinegar, eggs, pickles, her 18 turkeys, her chickens. And she ran out and begged the guard. And he said, I cannot help you, madam. It's orders. Stop. Alas, little did I think that it was trying to save my house from plunder and fire that they were forcing my boys, her slaves, from home at the point of a bayonet. I personally think they probably didn't have to force them. I think they were probably like, hey, does that bitch pay you? No, we will. Okay. Like, <laughs> does not take much to really put two and two together there. Um, so yeah, they came through. Some of her slaves went with them. Yikes. Sherman himself and a greater portion of his army passed on my house that day. All day as the sad moments rolled on, they were passing not only in front of my house from b b behind, they tore down my garden palings, made a road through my backyard, driving their stock and riding through, tearing down my fences. Literally, they just fucked her shit up. They basically fucked her shit up. And then she's like begging God. Um, yeah. So she said, a much stronger a rebel. She said, I'm Sherman's army is leaving me poor by $30,000 and a much stronger rebel. Um, do we only use the term slave retrospectively? Did no one use that word back then? They definitely did, but it was kind of like a, like they would say, those are my boys. Like, like slave was like a, I don't want to say a negative connotation, but like it is what ex it sounds like. So I think they used other words to like take the guilt away from themselves maybe. Um, but it, people did use that word back then. So here's some drawings and pictures of Sherman's army coming through the South. Here is a picture of them ripping the railroads up. Are those $30,000 in the form of humans, ma'am? Probably. And that would be $30,000 of back then money. So they really fucked her shit up. So they made it sound like it was okay. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the word servant. Um, how long was the breeding of African Americans? Really all the way up until slavery ended. So really from the breeding thing, I talked about it a little bit in my Causes of the Civil War stream. That was really a thing from like the early 1800s to like the mid 1800s was that was when that was the most intense because the international slave trade has ended. So here's another picture. Now the South really can't move like any of their resources around, which is rather, rather unfortunate from them. So this is the part that gets me is the white people in Georgia being like they kidnapped my slaves. Literally, they would come through with the Emancipation Proclamation and be like, our president says you're free. If you come with us, you won't have to be a slave and you can get a paying job. Do you want to come? Yep. Really not, not a difficult choice for anyone to make. So I know that she said she was from Covington. I'm guessing that she lived on the outskirts of Covington because downtown Covington like literally was fine. Sherman and his troops went through and they did take food and livestock, but they did not burn it to the ground. But honestly, that kind of rings true of her experience because like she said, they fucked her shit up, but I think her house was still standing. Um. So anyway, the like southern small town gossip is that apparently Sherman had have we talked about the presidents and the sexual assault of slaves uh, in passing but not super super in depth um because in my cause of the civil war one it was more like 1800s history and that that did occur like the whole time but we really didn't get into like specific presidents but that is very much true and very much happened but anyway apparently Sherman had like a mistress or a girlfriend or whatever in Covington. So that's why they didn't burn it down, which is just hilarious to me. So another aspect of this was the Andersonville prison. The Andersonville prison was a military prison facility or facility, uh, a military prison facility that was in Georgia at this time. This was a Confederate owned prison. So that meant the soldiers inside of it were Union soldiers. So it was in operation for 14 months. 45,000 Union soldiers were imprisoned there. 13,000 of them died from disease and poor sanitation and malnutrition and overcrowding. It is about 16 acres of land that was covered by a 15 foot high stockade wall um, and then it was enlarged to compensate for overpopulation so I'm going to show you a couple little things about the Andersonville prison um, I'm going to skip over this this is kind of boring it's like men at a museum talking about it I'm just going to show you the movie part so again this is from like a recent film but 
It is what the Andersonville prison was like. So again, this is a prison in the South that they are putting Union soldiers in. The Confederates are trying to capture Union soldiers because at this point, the Union is coming into the South. So if we capture you, then you can't fight. So they basically were just like putting them in a timeout so that they couldn't fight. Let's watch some nerds discuss it. But like, we're gonna watch the movie instead because we're out running out of time. So again, the term prison is being a little ambitious here to again describe to you, it is a field with a fence around it. All right, we'll listen to the nerds in a second. Everything. Well, they do whatever they do in the water even before it gets down to us. You're seeing a tenth of what we do to it. I'm going to start over because what he's talking about with the water is important. They built this whole place downstream from their tents. Horses, dogs, everything. So they do whatever they do in the water even before it gets down to us. You're seeing a tenth of what we do to it once it gets down here. Everything. That's why this place has such a stink to it. Don't worry. You won't notice it after a couple of months. You think they got kids watching us here? Yeah, the Reds are running out of men. They're robbing a cradle and the grave to guard us. So what they're saying is the Confederates, they call them the rebels because they're rebelling against... Um, do what we do, like use it as a bathroom. Yes. So they're talking about how the Confederates are running out of soldiers. So that's why they have literal children guarding this prison because all the like men are off fighting. Hey, Johnny, you got something to eat? Yeah, I got something to eat. What you got? Got two ears of corn. I'll give you a dollar for them. Yankee greenback for both ears. You come over here. Not me. I'm not coming over there. Why not? Because it's the deadline. You'll shoot me if I do. You want some or not? All right. Here I come. Hey, wait. Crazy. You know the rules. You all know the rules. I wonder, Lieutenant. What do they do, Dick? Shoot you for fun in here? So let's watch the nerds talk about it. I'm going to speed it up because the nerds are kind of boring. I'm going to be honest. We might not watch the whole thing. That is not developmentally appropriate. <laughs> I don't trust preteens to watch anything. I'm Gary Edelman with the Civil War Trust War Department, and we're here at the Andersonville National Historic Site, and I'm with Chief of Interpretation Eric Leonard, and we're going to be talking all about Andersonville, Camp Sumter. Thanks for joining us. Glad you're here. I think that they should hire me to do things like this. I think I would provide a much better analysis. In fact, I think this summer I might just march my ass on down to the Andersonville historic whatever the fuck and film a different video. Um, so here we are in the northeast corner of the expanded stockade. What are some of the features of the stockade that, you, that one could see when they come here? The defining feature is the wall with the, the sentry posts <laughs> the all the way around. The defining feature. You mean the only wall, feature? The pine posts harvested locally at the site. 20 feet tall, buried five feet into the ground to form a 15 foot perimeter. Just inside that is a very humble fence line. And that fence is probably the single most significant so there's feature the here. That is the deadline. And it, the deadline is a management tool whose purpose is simply to keep prisoners away from the wall and away from guards. And very humble. how does the fence do that? It's not the fence, it's what the guards do associated with the deadline. Guards here are instructed to shoot to kill prisoners who touch or cross that deadline. What else is within the stockade? A mass of people. And you know, this this is a complex place where you have veteran soldiers who are you know, attempting to maintain life and normalcy. <laughs> the in the music place in the is, background. It, that's very, very difficult. Food is brought in once a day. Shelter depends on what you modern have examples. You when you arrive and what you can improvise. And those shelters US. vary wildly depending on the resources of the individual prisoner, their ingenuity. Water was provided you know, in a, a single stream going through the middle of the original stockade when it was designed. And it's important to note the prison was intended, it was designed to hold six to 10,000 prisoners. I told By you August, they're nerds. It's three times that capacity, and that, that expansion has consequences. 
the floodplain of the prison, that flat spot becomes in, becomes a swamp that is a vile place with maggots, food, excrement, grease from the guard camps and the prison facilities located outside of the stockade wall, just upstream. Lots to think about. there's a lot going on in this complex outside the stockade. Can you describe that in brief? Why do I feel like I'm watching a documentary at the America Pavilion of Epcot? You have a series of hospitals serving both the prison population and the Confederate guard staff. Two miles to the south of the main compound was a smallpox hospital used to isolate the prisoners with that dreaded disease. The Camp Sumter military prison complex stretches an entire mile to the west to the train tracks, the community of Andersonville, and you have guard camps, warehouses, officers' quarters and offices, you know, all surrounding the prison. You get it. You get it. Um, I don't know why I always forget that war is, like, so bad. Like, I always... Like, when I read about it, I'm like, oh my god, this is so fucked up. Like, why would you do that? Why would you do that? So, speaking of fucked up, how is the government of the Confederate States of America doing? Now we're going to kind of get into more of, like, the social political stuff. So, one is the cotton embargo. Jefferson Davis was the president of the Confederacy for, like, the five minutes that it existed. He decided to engage in a cotton embargo at an attempt to play economic blackball before or blackmail before the war cotton was the south's most valuable crop and it was 59 percent of u.s exports so like the south was really important in the building of the economics of this country which i've talked about the other day so for southern producers the war disrupted both the production and marketing of what they presumed would be the financial basis of their new country davis was engaged in blackmailing great britain into recognizing the confederacy so he was like we're not going to sell you cotton until you recognize that we're our own country but it totally fucking backfired because the Confederate foreign policy had been depending on the cotton diplomacy because many of the political leaders were plantation owners. So they believed that an artificial cotton shortage would secure diplomatic recognition and military aid because they were like oh if we like don't sell them cotton they're gonna have to recognize us and help us the primary target of this was great britain so they placed an embargo on cotton exports but in late january 1862 cotton traders in liverpool held over a quarter of a million bales so it really did not work at all because the british just started producing cotton in india instead so instead of this the south just like lost a ton of money basically so like they tried to blackmail people but it really didn't work seems like racism is not a great basis for a government because it's not another problem that they had were the bread riots in 1862 this again we're backtracking a little bit to talk about like political stuff confederate congress attempted to restrict cotton production in favor of food production state governments tried to persuade their citizens to start planting food crops the newspapers started promoting that goal to concert with the government but the planters want money so they continued to plant cotton union blockade of confederate forces marked decreased food imports the british were like did you just forget we can colonize somewhere else for cotton literally the british were like okay seems messy bye um so as food became scarcer prices increased very dramatically also because farmers were now soldiers at war and fighting had destroyed a lot of the farmland so a food shortage in richmond virginia reached a critical point and in march there was an unusually large snowstorm and the melting snow made muddy roads impassable so they couldn't even transport what little food they did have and um there was an influx of civil servants and government placed in this area because of the war so president davis called Called for a day of fasting and prayer. Oh my God. You think people are going to respond well to that? So that was on March 27th. A couple days later, riots erupted. And this is called the bread riot because people were literally starving. Mother nature is anti-slavery is confirmed. A day of fasting is crazy. They literally, they were like, everything's totally fine and we are winning. I just think we should all not eat food for one day. It's just like what I'm thinking. A um, hundred women also took their complaints to Letcher, who was um, the governor. Despite brandishing axes, knives, and other weapons, the group remained initially calm. But then when the governor had no solutions, they started chanting, bread, bread, bread or blood. 
Um, and then the alarmed governor called the public guard and it didn't work. And the people robbed the government storehouses and looted and grabbed all the food they could. I think that's fine. I'm personally fine with that. The bread riot was only controlled when the president climbed on top of a wagon in the street and was like, guys, stop it for real this time. Um, and the riot was subdued when Davis began to count to five and threatened to fire on his own citizens if quiet was not restored. Sounds like it's going great, personally. And then their real kicker was inflation. I'm going to kind of skip through this. Basically, their inflation was fucking insane. Um, it was 600%. The cost of living had increased 92 times. So what used to be $1 is now $92. I think... Um, what was it? Yeah, I'm going to go th skip over some of the numbers here. But yeah, everything got super, super, super fucking expensive. Also because they're running out of food. So yeah, the South is a fucking mess. The Confederate states don't know how to run a government. Everything is terrible. So moving into that fourth phase of the war, capture Richmond, Virginia. Capture Richmond, Virginia. This is the capital of the South. The capital of the South was literally like right next to the capital of the North, Richmond, Virginia in Washington, D.C. This happened four years after the Battle of Fort Sumter. So Confederate President Jefferson Davis and his cabinet were forced to flee Richmond, Virginia as fires spread throughout and the city city was surrendered so that's like all the military history we're gonna get into more of like the social stuff and the actual effects on people wow is this one of the reasons why the south in the u.s is poorer i wonder partially yeah um so on april 9th 1865 grant met lee at appomattox courthouse and lee surrendered the confederate army the union had won Kerchow. So let's talk about more like social, political stuff like that. So after the Emancipation Proclamation, which I promise you we're going to talk about in a second when we talk about Lincoln's politics, the governor of Massachusetts organized the Black Regiment, the most fam the famous Massachusetts 54th. There were black soldiers for the Union. That was very, very common. Not as common as white soldiers, but it was common. Swiftly thereafter, other states began to recruit black soldiers as well. And in May 1863, the federal government established the Bureau of Colored Troops to supervise their enlistment. Because remember... Even though the North is anti-slavery, there's still white people in 1863, so they still segregated the military and treated these men fucking horribly. By the end of the war, one in eight Union soldiers was black, and the majority of them were formerly enslaved. A lot of the men, mainly men, living in the South as slaves, being enslaved, were freed by Sherman and joined the military because the military gets paid very natural. So black soldiers only received um, $7 a month when white soldiers got $14 a month. And they were most often assigned to menial tasks behind the lines. This is very ironic to me is that the white generals were like, these black men are too weak to fight. We got to have them making food. Like, how are you letting your toxic masculinity go so far that you're willing to die like I like if I'm trying to think of their perspective like you would think a racist person would not want to do the dangerous job and would make the person they view as less than a person do it but they're so like toxically masculine that they're like I will die you can dig holes like okay sounds good I feel like I'd want the admin jobs, right? Like, I'm not saying anyone should die. I've been very clear that um, I did my undergraduate history thesis on this. I hope I'm doing you justice. Play yourself, racist. Also, the reason why no one's ever smiling is because it took like 10 minutes to take a photo. That's why that guy is kind of blurry because I guess he moved. Um, I think it's so funny that they seized Robert E. Lee's land and then put the National Cemetery on it. I didn't even know that. I think the delusion kind of worked in black men's favor here. Yeah, I just found that to be very, very interesting. But even in the face of significant discrimination and racist attacks from their co-workers, black soldiers served and fought bravely, and 21 black soldiers received congressional medals of honor throughout the war. So... Um, do, 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 do. I am going to skip over some of this. So issues of the Emancipation Proclamation and mil or issues of emancipation and military service were intertwined. Because at first, 
a lot of free black men were like, I want to fight in the war. Like when they found out the war was starting, they volunteered to fight. But there was a law that prevented black men from being in the U.S. Army. Um, it was like a really old law from like, uh, what would this be, like 70 years prior. So in Boston, would-be volunteers um, passed a resolution requesting the government modify its laws. So Lincoln wrestled with this idea of whether or not to allow black troops to join the military because he was worried that if they let black men join the military, then the border states would secede. If you remember from the beginning when I was talking about the border states... That's why he's like, oh, I don't know about that, because they don't want border states to secede because the border states were like a buffer of the fighting. So, again, Lincoln's not like our equality hero. Um, but because there was a lot of former slaves and there was a declining number of white volunteers, the Union Army pushed the government into reconsidering that ban. So as a result, in 1862, Congress passed the Second Confiscation and Militia Act, freeing slaves who had masters in the Confederate Army. And two days later, slavery was abolished in the territories of the United States when Lincoln did the Emancipation Proclamation, which only applied to the South which we'll talk about in a second so by the end of the war like we said there were uh, 179,000 black men in the army which was about 10 percent and 19,000 in the navy nearly 40,000 black men died during the war and about 30,000 of that was from infection or disease they worked in tons of different jobs and various various things black women could not join the military but they did serve as nurses spies and scouts the most famous being Harriet Tubman who actually scouted for a volunteer force and led that volunteer force if you've seen the movie Harriet they talk about that and it's great 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 so (coughs) (coughs) here is um a couple of stories we're running out of a little bit of time so I'm going to skip through this because we already talked about the pay discrimination and they did face greater peril because if you think about it if you're a white soldier in the south and you get kidnapped like yeah you're probably going to be in the Andersonville prison but if you're a black soldier in the south and you get kidnapped you're going to be put into slavery even if you never have been. So that was like a huge, huge, huge risk. So as a result, President Lincoln issued General Order 252, threatening reprisal on Confederate prisoners for any mistreatment of black troops. So Lincoln was basically like, if you take our troops and enslave them, we'll do the same shit to yours. We don't care that they're white. Um, Could black women work back then, like when they were freed, but how did they survive? Yes, and a lot of them worked in like uh, domestic jobs. I have a really, really, really old stream about the Atlanta washerwomen's strike. A lot of them worked in like domestic home cleaning jobs. My favorite Harriet Tubman quote is live free or die. That is a really, really good quote. Um, I wonder if the total numbers were actual war versus disease. Yeah, a lot of people died of disease because like literally – If you had an injury and they had left you alone, you probably would have been fine. But like you would injure like your arm and then they would amputate it. But then you would get a disease because they didn't clean the amputation knife before the guy before you. So like that kind of sucks. So this is an ad. It says to colored men, freedom, protection, pay and a call to military duty, protection of colored troops, the war department. So like they were very much recruiting black men. Um, And this is an unidentified African-American soldier in a Union uniform with his wife and two daughters. So that is a cool picture that I found. So women during the war, women fought on both sides of this war. And by fought, I don't necessarily mean like literally in the military. But when the war broke out in 1861, women and men alike volunteered for the fight. In northern states, women organized ladies' aid societies to supply the troops with food and uniforms and vegetables and all those things like that, blankets, cash, Lots of shit women in the North were doing. Um, And many women wanted to take a more active role in the war. So they were inspired by the work of Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War and wanted to find a way to work on the front lines. So a lot of them worked as nurses. So they succeeded in in 1861 when the federal government agreed to a preventative, hygienic, and sanitary service for the benefit of the Army. And this was called the U.S. Sanitary Commission. And their main objective Objective was to combat preventable disease and infections by providing improving conditions in army camps and hospitals and to provide relief. They had over $15 million in supplies, most of which had been collected by women to the Union Army. 
Nearly 20,000 women worked directly for the Union Army. Working class white women and free and enslaved African American women worked as laundresses, cooks, and, and matrons. Because remember, some of the Union states, like Missouri, allowed slavery. So there are some slaves working for the Union. Not a ton, but there were some. Um, and 3,000 middle-class white women worked as nurses. The activist Dorothea Dix was the superintendent of Army nurses and put out a call for volunteers, for maternal volunteers who would not distract the troops or behave in unfeminine ways. <laughs> nurses must be past 30 years of age, healthy, plain to almost repulsion in dress, and devoid of any personal attractions. <laughs> She said, ugly bitches, rise up. It's your time. <laughs> so army nurses, you must be ugly. I cannot reiterate how must you must be ugly. Me on love is <laughs> So army nurses traveled from hospital to hospital. So that's kind of what's going on with women of the north. Women of the north are like, let's fundraise. Let's be nurses. Women of the South, same shit, just for slavery. So white women in the South threw themselves into the war with the same amount of zeal. They had less money and less resources, but they did the same shit. They cooked, they sewed, they gave uniforms, they were caring for wounded soldiers, they were doing their whole shit. However, this is the real kicker. Many Southern women, especially wealthy ones, made their slaves do everything, so they had never had any experience of doing hard work. So they lost their fucking mind when the war happened and a bunch of people left and they actually had to, like, take care of things and do work. They had, like, mental breakdowns, so, like, they couldn't help with the war because they were going through, like, white women's stress is basically what's happening. Because for the first time, they have to, like, cook food in their house for themselves they're like ah ah i don't know what to do <laughs> so some women did engage in military combat there have been about 400 women that we have discovered um had disguised themselves as men to fight in the civil war this happened on both sides they found army records of soldiers who were discovered to be women during their service a very mulan um, and historians found pension cases for women who had revealed themselves after the war ended. It is possible that the number is much higher since historians only have records of ones that were discovered or revealed themselves. But it is also possible that some women who went into like pretended to be men to fight established a new identity as a male veteran like they used. I don't know if. It was like a transgender thing or just like an economic opportunity thing. But some of them were like, yeah, I'm a man. And then when they did well in the war, they were like, yes, it is me, sir. I will take my pension now. So <clears throat> very, very interesting. Um, Albert DJ Cashier took this as opportunity to establish a new identity as a male citizen. The medical doctor saw no reason to out a citizen who performed their duty and kept his transition a secret from the rest of his unit. Albert said, trans rights, I'm a man and I will fight in the war, period, period. Here is Miss F.L. Clayton. I don't think she was trans because she went back to being a woman after the war was over. So I, don't, I also don't think that they had even any language or description around that at the time. Um, but this is a picture of her before the war and after or b before the war and during, not after. Sometimes is a lesbian. <laughs> talking about so Frances Clayton that's her in and out of her soldier uniform her and her husband joined the Union Army together enlisting in different states to make sure that she was not caught she took the name Jack Williams during her service and after 22 months of fighting side by side with her husband he was killed at the Battle of Stones River and she later recalled stepping over her husband's dead body to escape the Confederate charge and shortly after the battle she revealed her true identity she was like my man's dead I'm leaving um, and the army discharged her she then traveled the country telling stories to the newspaper and trying to get the government to pay her her pension um, and it's unknown if she ever received that 
Okay, cheekbones. <laughs> Y'all are hilarious. So we don't know who this woman is, but this is a black woman who's wearing like a man's military uniform. So her photographs stand as evidence that black women disguised themselves as men to fight in the war. We just don't know much beyond that. We don't know who she is or why she did this or where she was from or anything that was going on here. We just know that she did that. This is literally Mulan. It's a tale as old as time. So women on the front lines. And um, can I just say, Southern women must have been the biggest complainers, like how they were complaining that they had to like cook their own food. I just know that they were not handling this well. So enslaved women were not free to contribute to the Union cause in the border states. They were not by choice, but you get what I'm saying, Um, because they never had the luxury of true womanhood to begin with. The Civil War promised its freedom, but it also added to women's burdens. In addition to their own plantation labor and household labor, many enslaved women had to do the work of their husbands and partners, too. The Confederate Army frequently recruited enslaved men and slave owners fleeing from Union troops often took their valuable enslaved male workers, but not women and children. So a lot of working class white women had similar experiences while their husbands and fathers and brothers were in the army they had to provide for their families on their own so during the civil war women faced a lot of new duties and responsibility um so this kind of changed what proper womanhood was and in a way like forced gender to progress which is very interesting so let's talk more about social political stuff all of that fun jazz now that we've gone through military who's allowed to fight who's not allowed to fight so we're going to go back kind of to the beginning of the war so at the beginning of 1961 the union the u.s army only had 16,000 troops so lincoln called for an increase of 23,000 in the regular army but the bulk of the fighting would need to be done by volunteers and state militias you get what you motherfucking pay for and that's what i can tell you if you're relying on state militias to win the war that's why the union was losing for the first two years because people don't fight very hard when you're not fucking paying them so voluntary recruits produced adequate forces for a brief amount of time so in 1863 congress passed the draft the draft is when it's like you have to go to war and all young adult males were eligible to be drafted But you could get out of the draft if you either paid $300 or you hired someone to fight in your place or just convince someone, I guess. So $3,000 in 1863 is $7,388.71 today. I would definitely pay seven grand to get out of going to war. This gives me the same vibes as when women entered the workforce during World War II. Generally, whenever times are tough, it pushes women's equality forward. That's why women out West got the right to vote a lot earlier because women had more power because out West there were not many people. So like if you had a farm, it was you and your wife. So she had more power than like, oh, I stay at home and like do nothing and like just mind the house not that staying at home is nothing but you know what I'm saying because women had to like build more things out west the gender equality was like pushed forward and during world war one and world war two women got more jobs because the men were off fighting the war so it's just like a very interesting like side effect of war now that's a true use of a rainy day fund take my money so I don't get the trauma of war Wyoming said women can vote, but that's all we're doing for minorities. So opposition to the draft was very, very widespread. Shooting your foot is free, 99. What did Southern white women with a ton of slaves do all day if they have no responsibilities? Complain and yell at their slaves, really, is what I think they were doing. And, like, pass on eating disorders to their daughters. Social responsibilities. Clubs gossip uh drugs a lot of them were doing weird things so anyway embroidery yeah they're really doing their hair church (laughs) that's really all I can think of so anyway opposition to the draft was very widespread they were called copperheads and it was mainly laborers like workers because they were like I just want to work at a factory like I don't want to go fight in this fucking war I don't need this at all 
The same as today, but without the opportunity to exploit their kids on TikTok. So violence sometimes erupted over the draft. Like in 1863, the New York City draft riots. This is when they read out the first names of the people that were being drafted. So as the business capital of the nation, New York was not happy about the Civil War because New York was losing the South as an important trading partner because, again, they're buying cotton from the South. So cotton was an extremely valuable product for New York's merchants. Cotton represented represented 40% of all goods that were shipped out of New York. And long after the slave trade was made illegal, the city's underground market and enslaved people continued to thrive. So this is what I'm saying. The North is not like a happy land of equality. So when civil war broke out in 1861, there was even talk of New York seceding from the Union because it was so intertwined business-wise with the Confederates. So as the war progressed and New York's anti-war politicians and newspapers kept warning its working class white citizens that emancipation would mean replacement of the labor force with thousands of enslaved people from the South. So there was a lot of like anti-black sentiment in the North among especially like the working poor and recent European immigrants because they were worried about like their jobs being taken was kind of their vibe. So when Lincoln announced the Emancipation Proclamation, this is really where people started extra freaking out. And then the new draft law sparked even more unrest. So it said that all male citizens between 20 and 35 and all unmarried men between 35 and 45 were subject to military duty. So life hack could get married, I guess. Um, But if you're under 35 and you're married, that doesn't fix it. Escaping is hard because they'd get caught. Were they not also essaying the people they enslaved? Yeah, they definitely were. Didn't they travel for work so the husbands weren't too far? Not the minorities are going to take our jobs starting during the Civil War. No, literally. It's like this country is a joke. Um, Where was I? Also, this was an old article. Like I said, it's 7,000 in today's money. So riots over the draft occurred because a lot of these immigrants and working poor people were upset that they had to go fight in this war and they're worried about the labor market and all of that stuff. So compounding the issue, black men were exempt from the draft because they were not considered citizens. So That's the second time that like the discrimination has like weirdly done an uno reverse, which I find fascinating. So black men weren't getting drafted, but again, they were volunteering in very high numbers. So there was a riot. People freaked the fuck out is basically what happened. So the first 24 hours after the lottery, the city was very quiet. And then the rioting started on July 13th. Thousands of white workers, mainly Irish and Irish Americans, started attacking military and government buildings. And this is the part that gets really nasty is after they started attacking the buildings, which like you don't want the government to draft you when you attack a building. That's freedom of speech, I guess. They started moving on to target black citizens, homes and businesses, because at this point, the war was pretty distinctly over slavery. So they tore down a the colored orphan asylum that had more than 200 children in it. And some of the people that went in there were armed with um, clubs and bats. They took a bedding, food and clothing, then were stopped short of assaulting the children who were forced to go to the city's asylum houses or al- alms houses. So literally they went like into a fucking orphanage which is a crazy ass thing to do they also turned their rage against white abolitionists so people that had been like prominently against slavery and they also took their rage out against white women who were married to black men um white dock workers were really against this as well because they were opposed to black men working alongside them really it just turned like really intense um And the New York leaders struggled with the task of how to deal with this. So they ended up declaring martial law. But on the third day of the rioting, it spread to Brooklyn and Staten Island. And it took 4,000 federal troops to basically shut this down. Imagine you're literally fighting in the fucking Civil War. You just went through the Battle of Gettysburg. And now you have to march your ass to New York to put down a riot. Read the room. Read the room. I thought interracial marriage wasn't legal at that time. It varied by place. um, And even though it was illegal, a lot of people did it. So this remains the deadliest riots in U.S. history. It made 3,000 black residents homeless. How many people died? I don't even think we said. 
Um, the total death toll at the time was 1900, but we think it might be as high as 1200. So a lot of people died. A lot of people were made homeless. This was more, um, violent than any other riot in U S history. So the riot, like we said, lasted for a couple days and a lot of people died glitch. How dare we? So that's kind of mobilization of the North. Let's move on to mobilization of the South. After seceding from the Union and setting up their own government, the Confederate States of America, they had to finance their war effort. Like, you do have to pay for war. You can't just not pay for it. So with a lack of success in raising funds, they had to pay for the war through paper currency, which they began issuing in 1861. By 1865, they had issued $1.5 billion in paper money, resulting in a 9,000% increase in the price of goods. So we already talked about that with the inflation, but their government's doing fucking terrible. So they had their own money, which was lame and stupid and useless after the war. And like the North, they first called on volunteers to fight, but then volunteers started declining because shocker, people don't want to go fight in a war. So the South passed the Conscription Act, which subjected all white males between 18 and 35 to military service for three years. So... Three years is a while. So basically the $1.5 billion was like $5, basically. Wow, the American government used to struggle to pay for war. <laughs> Bitcoin. What was this bill? 50 cents. That's not going to get you far anymore. Um, so this is fucking crazy. Someone in my TikTok comments told me about that. There was a law. I'm going to call it the 20 slave law. I will allow you to read the other names they called it. And for those of you on TikTok, this is why you have to come to Twitch to see the slides. There was a law that is simply, it, it, it specifically exempted people from military service as long as they owned 20 slaves. So... Y'all are willing to die over slavery, except you're actually fucking not. Because you're going to draft all of the poor white workers to defend your right to have slaves, which is fucking insane. And if you watch last week's stream, I talk about how the majority of white Southerners did not own slaves. And I don't say that to be like, most people were good people because they weren't. I say that to reiterate how this was a ruling class of wealthy elites having poor people do their bidding. That's what's going on here. So this was passed as the second part of the Conscription Act in 1862. And this was a reaction to Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. So they kind of did be like, um, so yeah. And additionally, many enslaved black men and women were forced to perform services like laundry cooking and manual labor, and a small number of enslaved and free black man participated in combat. I would love to interview the free black man in the South that fought for the Confederacy. That's not adding up for me. I would like to hear your perspective, sir. So <clears throat> black soldiers for the Confederates. The lives of Southern black people changed immeasurably during the years of the war. Many Southern slaves took advantage of the fog of war to escape towards freedom. So a lot of them took this chance to escape. Before the Emancipation Proclamation was adopted, these escapes usually meant congregating around Union armies that were operating in Southern territory. Vast columns of escaped slaves followed almost every major Union army at one point. These people, sometimes called contrabands as confiscated enemy property, frequently served as scouts and spies. So enslaved men were either hired out by their enslavers or forced to work for the Confederate army. Free black men were also sometimes forcibly impressed or for impressed means like drafted kind of and forced to perform manual labor for the army. <coughs> the government's use of black labor, whether free or enslaved, followed patterns established during slavery, which makes a lot of sense. Black men were forced to maintain local roads and other public property as well. Some black Southerners aided the Confederacy. Most of these were forced to accompany their masters or forced to toil, like work, behind the lines. Black men were not legally allowed to serve as combat soldiers, so like we said, they did mainly manual labor. There were no black Confederate combat units during the war, um, and no documentation of any black men being paid as a Confederate soldier. So I, I guess that makes sense that all the ones were forced. So I guess that man I was saying I wanted his perspective. This is proving he does not exist, which checks out. Um, it's not to say that no black men ever fired a gun for Confederacy. Like we said, a lot of them were forced to because their masters brought them 
to the war near there. You kind of are forced to do what they say. So when the Emancipation Proclamation took effect on January 1st, 1863, Union forces regained control of large swaths of the South. And though now they claim that the Emancipation Proclamation was effectively useless, it did help because it helped recruit black people to join the Northern Army. And then lots of them left to go to Northern territories, like we said. This is a little bit redundant, so I'm going to skip over that. So war aims like we said for the first two years of the war lincoln just wanted to preserve the union he fought for nationalistic reasons not to end slavery and when lincoln made this plan he wrote to horace greeley like we said that quote if i could save the union without freeing any slave i would do it if i could do it by freeing all the slaves i would do it so Really, he didn't have much of a stand on it. Lincoln did not disprove of emancipation, but he understood it was not supported by the majority of Americans. So then we moved to 1862. I should have done this at the beginning. I feel like that would have made more sense. I'm sorry. And sorry, I snorted my allergy snot in the mic. So in April 1862, um, radical Republicans passed a bill abolishing slavery in Washington, D.C. In June, a law was passed that outlawed slavery in the new territories. And in July, Congress passed the Confiscation Act, which freed all slaves owned by anyone supporting the insurrection. So anyone supporting the South, the Union recognizes their slaves as free people now. Not citizens, I was about to say that. As free free people. So even though this law has no teeth in the South, like even though, again, with laws like the Emancipation Proclamation and the Confiscation Act, they do not think that Southerners are going to go run outside and be like, you're free to leave. No one thought that was going to happen. They were doing it for like political reasons and to like make the South look bad. And so that they had legal footing once they were there was more So it wasn't until after the Battle of Antietam, like I said earlier, that Lincoln calculated that the nation was ready for a shift here because now we've been at war for two years. So preserving the Union isn't really like getting people riled up enough anymore. So with morale slipping, Lincoln made the shift to an offensive war. And instead of saving the Union to now be a total war to rectify the moral wrong of slavery. So Lincoln really didn't start talking much about slavery until halfway through the war, which is kind of intense. On September 22nd, 1862, he made his Emancipation Proclamation. This was an executive order that he now made public. And it said, after January 1st, all states in areas of the rebellion, all states in areas in rebellion against the United States, so that means all slaves in Confederate states, shall then thenceforward and be forever free. So like permanently, this is the interesting part. No single slave walked free that day. This made no difference. The difference that this made is because now the Union troop, the Union military going through, like I said, can be like, want to come with us? Want to come with us? Want to come with us? That's why he passed it. And he purposefully wrote states in rebellion. He did not write the United States. He wrote states in rebellion. So that means the border states, this does not apply to them. So slaves in Missouri, Missouri's a union state. Those are still very much people that are being enslaved. This, perfect, the squash banana. This was a military strategy. This was done to increase military recruitment and to increase morale for the war. This was not done to actually have people walk free. The term Emancipation Proclamation is kind of slay, though. No, it really, really is. It did have the effect of reframing and reinvigorating the war aim in the North while preventing the Confederacy from gaining support from European powers. Because Europe had been anti-slavery for a while, not anti-slavery like in like an abolitionist cool way, but in like a, they kind of had stopped practicing slavery even though they were still practicing colonialism and if you think about it colonialism is a form of slavery but anyway Europe realized that the south was really fighting for slavery because remember before this they were just like they're going through a civil war I don't really know but now Europe really didn't want to help the south they already kind of didn't care that much and now they really were like that's going to make us look bad so let's not participate in that at all so Lincoln as a wartime president 
He did a lot. So Lincoln boldly moved to use the war powers of the president by sending troops into battle without asking Congress for a declaration of war. Because normally, why can the president just declare an entire nation's slavery law after the states fought about it for so long? So this is the thing. During the war, Lincoln really said, fuck checks and balances. Like, he really is just doing whatever he wants at this point. And, like, legally speaking, the Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order. It wasn't really, like, truly ending slavery till we passed the 13th Amendment later. So that's kind of how he was able to do that. <clears throat> but this is more about he didn't declare it. He proclaimed it. It's like the Michael Scott, I declare bankruptcy. You can't just say that. I didn't say it. I declared it. Um, so Lincoln like really said, fuck our government system. Fuck the Constitution. I'm going to do what I need to do. Because normally the way it works is the president gets like Congress to agree to declare war. Congress is the one that's like, yes, we're declaring war. Lincoln didn't do that because he was like, this is not a war. This is a domestic insurrection. So I guess he does have a point with that one. No, Missouri is not a Confederate state. Yes, Missouri is not a Confederate state. Like we said, Missouri is a border state that allowed enslavement. And Lincoln was just like letting them do that. So. And you just have drinking the Dr. Pepper because it's like 9 p.m. But it's so good. So his greatest political problem was widespread opposition to the war in the north. So he ordered... <laughs> This is insane. He ordered the arrest of civilian dissenters. So if you were having like an anti-war protest, he was like, lock her up, lock her up. He also suspended the right of habeas corpus. Habeas corpus is the right to a speedy trial. So that's literally your right to a trial. And he was like, I don't think we need that. So there's a lot more to this story. There's lots of legal battles, but I didn't want to like get into the boring minutia of that. So in 1863, Lincoln signed the Habeas Corpus Suspension Act, which gave him the authority to suspend habeas corpus in certain cases. This is one of his most controversial decisions. It allows for the detainment of prisoners without a trial. Um, so General Ambrose Burnside, under Lincoln's order, arrested Peace Democrat Clement Valdingham and banned the publication of the Chicago Times because they were like anti-war. These actions drew widespread criticism, but Lincoln defended himself by saying that in cases of rebellion, certain actions that certain actions that might be illegal in peacetime are necessary for their survival. He said, what if I just do what I want? What then? He's kind of unhinged. So he kind of went into pre-dictator mode. He really did. He was like, this country's fucked and I don't even fucking care. Habeas corpus, I've never heard of her. The power to suspend habeas corpus is granted in the Constitution, but there's been debate whether this power belongs to the president or whether it belongs to Congress. The Constitution states that the privilege of the right of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless in cases of rebellion or when public safety requires it. So because the Constitution says... In cases of rebellion, that's what's happening. That's why when people are like, the Constitution, we have to abide by it. I'm like, I see some flaws personally. <laughs> um, Lincoln believed that the rebellion justified this. And so the suspension continued throughout the remainder of the war. Oh, yeah. Great topic to be vague on. It's almost like you shouldn't let 25 year olds write a constitution. So over 13,000 people were arrested and held without trial. As it turns out, many of them had done nothing wrong. Um, so building popular opinion. Lincoln used new tools of persuasion. He said propaganda. I'm doing it. I'm going to do propaganda. He had pamphlets, posters, and songs. I was going to make you listen to them, but they're kind of not that good. <laughs> and he hired a bunch of photographers. Back then, photo was like new, so this was like cool. Um, organized by Matthew Brady to publish images of the many dead people on the Civil War battlefield. And this was meant to demonstrate the level of sacrifice that had been given to preserve the Union. I'll play the songs while you guys are doing the little game at the end. Someone remind me. Graphic design is his passion. And then the Gettysburg Address. Speeches were very, very, very important. Lincoln was going around yapping. He's a certified yapper and he wanted to tell everyone. 
One of the most significant speeches in U.S. history is Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. So he delivered this speech when they were dedicating the National Cemetery at Gettysburg. This was four months after the deadly Battle of Gettysburg, which, like we said, was like multiple days and disgusting and horrible and a ton of people died. Also, oh, my God, this is crazy. So... You know how we saw they like march with the little drums. You're with me, right? They're marching with the drums. Do you know how like vultures and crows, like they like to eat dead things and dead bodies? They learned, the fucking birds learned that the drums meant people were about to die. So they would follow the army into battle. Imagine you got drafted like you you're 18. You've been working at a factory for 10 years. You just get fucking drafted into this war. You've never been to the South in your entire life. And then you're fucking marching. This little like 10 year old boy is playing the drums. And then the fucking death bird is just following you. (gasps) Ah! So spooky. Spooky. But, well, you just got my hook for tomorrow's Gettysburg lesson. So very crazy about the bird thing. Also about the battles, they smell really bad because when you die, you shit yourself. So all the men that were dying were shitting themselves. So it just smelled like blood and shit and gunpowder. Disgusting. So Battle of Gettysburg, terrible. Lincoln gives the Gettysburg Address. He wasn't even supposed to be there, I don't think. It was supposed to be a speech from somebody else. And then like last minute, he decided to come. And then they were like, make a speech. President. And then he made like the most famous speech ever. And I just switched my mic. That's why it sounds different. Here's the Gettysburg Address. It's pretty short. Fuck off on having to fight. Four score you know you're gonna and be seven burnt. years Lynch. ago. Our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. This is not his voice, by the way. You can find it online with his voice. This is actually one of the first audio recordings in human history, but it's so scratchy and so hard to understand. But if you want to listen to it, you can. Liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation (laughs) imagine being the og speaker and getting ready to do your speech and then the president comes or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure we are met on a great battlefield of that war we have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live It is altogether fitting and proper. Do you ever think about the fact of like how I think we're moving backwards in evolution? Because at the time, everyone was like, this is such a short speech and it was incredible. Like everyone loved it, but I have no fucking attention span because I'm so addicted to TikTok. So we're 55 seconds in and I'm like, I'm kind of over it. I think I get the point. (laughs) That we should do this. But in a larger sense. We cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. They, the year so far, so nobly advanced. Great work, guys. You died for this country. We respect what you did. Thank you for that. (laughs) It is rather for us to be here, dedicated to the great task remaining before us. That from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. And this was considered short. We here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. I like this part. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom. And that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth 
The guy before him spoke for like two hours. Yeah, so this part he does kind of pop off because he's saying like we're having a new birth of freedom. So what he's trying to imply, which I wish he had just said, me when I use chat GPT for my essay, what he's trying to imply is that like we fought in the Revolutionary War from free for freedom from Britain. Now we have to fight in the Civil War to be free from slavery is like what he's trying to say. So yeah. That's his little speech moment. Um, so this solidified the revised cause of the war. Because remember, originally he just wanted to keep the country together. Now his new cause for the war was a new birth of freedom. And near the end of the war, he did have an election, the election of 1864. But the South couldn't vote because you seceded. So you're not allowed to vote anymore. Oh, sorry. Um, so he defeated the nominee, former General George McClellan. He got 55 percent of the popular vote. So he won the presidency relatively easily because at this point the war was almost over and he was winning. So people were kind of into him. So we low key already talked about this. There's a lot more detail to this story about people arguing and one guy surrendered and his wife was like, fuck you. We don't surrender. And then another general was like, keep fighting. There's a lot of chaos, but President Davis did flee Richmond, Virginia, and the surrender did happen a week later on April 9th. So the, one of the most significant surrenders to take place was General Robert E. Lee, the Confederate's most respected commander, surrendering his only army to Ulysses S. Grant. So there were some other generals who didn't surrender, but like when the most important one surrenders, it's kind of like... It's over. So several other Confederate forces, some large and some small, withdrew and had yet to surrender before Andrew Johnson could officially declare the war was over. So the war ended with the surrender, but legally speaking, it didn't end until a couple weeks later. Lincoln got shot um, a week after the surrender at Appomattox, though. So later on in life, when we learn about Reconstruction, you'll learn about that. But that's why they're surrendering to Andrew Johnson and not as President Lincoln, because... He got shot. So the Grant-Lee agreement served not only as a signal that the South had lost the war, but also a model for the rest of the surrenders. So like I said, the other surrenders went down later, and it took a long time to def officially declare the war over. But technically, the fighting ended 1865. What happens when you surrender? So we'll, when we learn Reconstruction a few weeks from now, we'll learn about it. But basically, these guys had to get pardoned because, like, you did form an insurrection against the U.S. government. So, like, the same charges that people on January 6th had is, like, what these people had. So it's not just, like, we pretend it never happened, but they didn't end up getting pardoned later, and it was really corrupt, and they faced no consequences, but they were supposed to face consequences. So here is some memes about the Civil War, ignoring and killing your elected leader because he wanted to keep people from owning slaves outside of where slaves already are which has literally no effect on you um <clears throat> i have no problem with the confederate flag as long as it is the historically accurate version this is like a deep fried facebook meme but still stands the south ever since the end of the civil war they pretend like they won they absolutely did not win they lost very obviously this is the MAGA hat having to choose between Confederate monuments are important and losers should not get participation trophies. Also, most of the Confederate monuments were put up like 40 years later by like a female white supremacist group, which I'll teach you about when we learn Reconstruction. Um, and the South didn't rise the first time. So when they say the South will rise again, again from what? When was the first time? I would love to know. So... Next week, I will be on vacation, so we will have no stream next week. I am sure, sorry. I'm going to try and figure out if I can upload an old one, but I kept trying and it wouldn't let me. So I don't know if I'm not famous enough or if I was just doing it wrong. Um, no wonder Southern people love Easter. They think that South is going to rise. So while I'm on vacation, don't open the door for anyone. I will try and do a replay. There's a way that apparently I can like upload an MP4 of an old stream and it'll let you guys like talk to each other in the chat. Um, and it'll have a little message, but I haven't figured out how to do it. So if I figure it out, I'll do it. But if I don't, I'm really sorry. Um, Big sad. I know. I'm sorry. I almost never skip stream, but where I'm going, I won't have my computer. So it's just really isn't working. Mr. Doctor's getting lit. Exactly. Exactly. 
Oh my God, why did it crop her so weird? So the following week on April 9th, I was thinking about doing Monica from Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, but I might change my mind. Maybe next time we'll have a substitute. Ooh, interesting. Maybe. I could like make someone log into my account. That kind of scares me though, because you never know. People be fucking crazy. So maybe Monica from Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. We're going to do a fun stream and then Fraz just had a baby. We're not putting more on her plate. We're going to do a fun stream and then we'll learn reconstruction because I was going to go straight into reconstruction, but um, I don't know. I just wanted to do like a fun little break. I feel like we like had such seriousness. So I'll be gone for a week. Then we'll talk about maybe Monica, maybe something else, Bravo, maybe something stupid. And then we will learn about reconstruction. So these were my sources for tonight. They were very long, including the Reddit one. So let's go ahead and play our little freaking game. Which one do you guys want to play? Let me know. You can have someone host us on their stream. Oh, interesting. I can. That's a good idea. Oh, my God. My mother would never come on here. Um, speaking of Bravo, are you going to watch the new Vanderpump show? I am. Himalaya. We never do Himalaya. So uh, I am watching the Valley. So anyway, this is how you join the game. I'll put the link in the chat. You don't have to join. You can just see the questions on my screen. It's just a fun little trivia game about what we learned. So you don't have to make an account. You don't have to put in your email address. I'm not looking for anything of the sort. Those of you on TikTok, I'm going to say goodbye to you for the night. Love you so much. Um, while you guys are joining this. So all you do is go to join.nearpod.com and then you enter that little code um, EZD65 and then it'll ask you for your name. You can put in something funny. If you don't want us to see your real name, don't use it. That's all I have to say on that. So let's find some Civil War songs for us to listen to while you all play this. Perfect. incredible play the songs you mentioned earlier thoughts on jackson Brittany. i'm very fascinated by them is my nose bleeding no i just have allergies great i'll give people a couple more minutes to join i want something with lyrics give me lyrics i want union songs <clears throat> Oh, there it is. Get into it. Get into it. Yeah. Hell yeah. I love this song. Does anyone want a freestyle? <laughs> no? It's a no from you all? Can you all hear it? I have it kind of quiet, and I don't have my mic switched. No, y'all can't hear it at all. That's hilarious because it's so loud for me. There you go. I thought you were kidding. No, I'm literally not. There you go. I'm going to start it over for you. I can't believe I was just vibing on my own. Imagine you're literally dying and this is the song that's on. Like, I can't even get Beyonce or anything. You're jamming to nothing. It's hilarious. <laughs> Thanks, now I can shake my ass to the beat. City girls, rise up! This I told you all, it's like kind of good. <laughs> We're only going to listen to Union ones, so you don't have to worry. You can enjoy the music. It's so unserious. Okay, I like the beat. Only winners get songs. Imagine this with gunshots and screams. Can I get a historically accurate recording? This is called Call to Muster and Battle Cry of Freedom. Yeah. A 
Okay, we're going to listen to... I'm going to start the game, and then we'll listen to a different one. All right, I'm starting Kerchow. Let me turn the Nearpod music off. So, this is Marching Through Georgia, a Union Civil War song. These questions, wow. All right, that was one song. Let me play you a new one. This is called Marching Along. Come on, boys, fall in. Raise the colors. High files, right? Prepare to march. We're proud soldiers from back home now. We're from the hills, the plains, and the valleys. And under the flag of our country, we shall rally. So keep the beat, boys. March along, proud and strong. March into battle with a song. Let's hear it, boys. March, march along. One, one. This one's really like a more of a direction giving vibe. This reminds me of like the cleanup song. Where were the draft riots that we discussed? I know there were more than one, but where were the ones that we talked about? Is this Fortnite of the 1800s? Yes. This is so chaotic. The way we're playing a game and listening to the Civil War music. This is exactly what my actual classroom is like. I'm just really doing whatever with them. New York. Not the Eras tour. What was Lincoln's main goal at the start of the war? The bands must have been why the rich people were watching. It was dinner and a show. <laughs> Lincoln's goal was to preserve the Union. Why didn't the Emancipation Proclamation apply to the border states? I didn't explicitly say this, but I think you can figure it out. The music makes it an immersive experience. So when I was in high school, we would do like a little writing activity at the start of class every day for my A push class. And my teacher would play during our little writing activity, he would play music from that time period. And when we were learning about the financial crisis of 2008, he played Taylor Swift. <laughs> um, in other news, he has me blocked on Facebook because I called him out for voting for Donald Trump, so. That is a relationship that died. Not the mommy vloggers, not bloggers, vloggers. My old A push teacher. He should have played Nelly for Todd <laughs> What forms of propaganda were not used by Lincoln and the Union? This song, it really is kind of good. Like, I see why people felt somewhat inspired. I see the vision. Why is class canceled next week? Would you ever stream about child actors? I have. I do have an old stream about that on my YouTube. It is from, like, December 2023. So like a little over a year ago. So nice job, squash banana, a middle school parking lot. Sherman went too easy on the south. The doctor five dollar fill up. Ellen, a Gettysburg parking lot. Drummer vultures, Annie Rice, Nat Madberg, Abe Lincoln's chaos era. Lizard breath, Rose, a burnt down Atlanta parking lot. Cotton and Delulu, Liz, Sierra says hi. Union nurse, drumming death birds, hole in Lincoln's head. Is, did you put the entire Gettysburg address as your name? That's absolutely incredible. Nice job, nice job. Confederate Union general circle jerk. Emancipated parking lot. Any memes, anything I missed? How are we feeling? How are we living? How are we laughing? How are we loving? Did we learn a lot? I was a little bit of a mess today, so I did not include every piece of info I wanted to, and I ended up kind of going a little quick through some of this stuff. 
But I hope you learned something and enjoyed it. Can we do a pre-post World War One, World War Two stream? I do have a post World War Two stream. I could do that. I haven't done the 1920s. Have I done the Great Depression? I think so. Common L for the South and racist. Slay Queen, you ate. Thank you, drumming death birds. I hope that this was a learning experience for you and you live, laughed, and learned about this. I'm going to miss you guys next week. I almost never take a week off from streaming because, I don't know, I just like like having a very solid routine and I also know that like when I watch something I get very angry when they take a week off and I don't want to do that to you so that's why like sometimes I just do Zillow and stuff because I feel like it's better than nothing but we'll take a break from each other it's going to be sad for both of us um but yeah I will be out of pool living my life living my dreams um union soldiers after watching their close calls dies can I offer you a nice egg in this trying time um, learned more than I did in high school. That's always what I'm going for. But anyway, have a great rest of your night. I love you so much. And I will see you here on April 9th to learn about something pop culture, fun, whatever. And then after that, we will learn reconstruction.